I'd like to start off by thanking Pierre, Maziar, and all the organizers for having me here uh, in Paris. It was long overdue visit and in Praxis, which is notoriously my favorite conference. So um, Klaus this morning said that very often the signal is in the noise. I think this can be used to motivate what I want to talk about. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, spectral, oops, what is it? Um, what is the, okay, here it is, tiny. Uh, spectral estimation, so estimating uh, a signal, which is actually the noise, in the frequency domain. Uh, for those of you who were in uh, Praxis last year, this is also the topic that I talked to you about. Uh, two reasons for continuing on this theme. Uh, well, of course, we worked hard uh, during the past year and there have been developments both on the theory and the experimental front that I would like to share with you. And secondly, I am convinced that this is an important topic as uh, quantum control engineering is stepping up, it's becoming more and more mature and it has to go, I'm quoting again, this time from Hendrik, uh, to real life systems. Um, so, okay, uh, let me just expand a little bit why I said that uh, uh, spectral estimation and accurate characterization of the actual noise that the target system we are interested in uh, is experiencing might be important uh, from both a fundamental, I'm a theorist, and uh, a practical reason. So first of all, from a general open quantum system point of view, uh, I would like to dream one day this control identification procedure to be able to tell us what the actual noise that we have to put in some model for open system dynamics really is. And in particular, uh, they should become uh, particularly useful in those uh, environments, think about most of the solid state systems which are complex and for which microscopic theories uh, for decoherence and dissipation, oftentimes there can be competing models and so it would be good to have a way to falsify or to validate uh, some of them. From a more uh, quantum information uh, processing perspective, um, we do have the beautiful results of the accuracy threshold theorems. However, all of them, to some uh, lesser or greater extent, they are predicated to hold under some well-behaved uh, behavior for the noise correlation functions, which in particular have to decay um, sufficiently rapidly uh, as the distance between qubits grows. Now, again, uh, we might have an experimentalist have a good hand about what is going on in their system usually, but uh, uh, ultimately I think that the one way to see whether these assumptions that theorists like me do are uh, faithful to reality is to go and check it uh, for real. Now, if you don't want to hear about fundamental uh, motivation, however, um, the most practical motivation I can think about, we have heard a lot about high fidelity quantum control engineering, and uh, although uh, a lot of quantum control protocols can be designed analytically and uh, with very minimal uh, knowledge of the underlying model system, it is true that uh, uh, these general purpose protocols, they will work, but they will never be optimal for a specific target system. So in the moment we really aim to come up with control protocols or error suppression strategies, or uh, you name the control task and you want to achieve it in an optimal way for the environment, for the noisy system that is living in your lab, then, uh, and think about in particular optimal control methods that requires an input, uh, a very well-defined model of the plant of the system, including the noise channel that it has, then it becomes valuable to have uh, accurate characterization of the noise. Um, there is also another compelling motivation that I haven't highlighted here because I will not touch upon in this talk, and this is uh, getting to know uh, the noisy environment might become very, very important also for pushing, we just heard the talk about uh, Eisenberg limit metrology, for pushing the limit of uh, quantum enhanced uh, sensing. 
So um, we often complain that uh, uh, qubits are fragile and they do are fragile against their noise, but this sensitivity can be turned upside down and can be a resource. So an old idea that I believe was born in Yale um, around this time and then other people picked up is that why not using the qubit themselves as spectrometers for their own noise. Now, this is an old idea, however, I would say that it has been um, uh, formulated in a broad and system independent uh, context in more control theoretical terms more recently. And basically, the control, the schematics is here. We have a, a, a sensing system, which I will think it to be a simple qubit or a, a collection of qubits, uh, moving on. And that is subject to noise. Uh, it can be either noise coming from a background environment. It can be controlled noise. In reality, it's going to be both. And uh, this qubit is going to be driven by some control dynamics that we design. And uh, we are going to do measurements uh, of certain observable properties, the task of what uh, is a spectral estimation uh, or quantum noise spectroscopy. Spectral estimation is more the, the terminology from classical signal processing. Uh, that's a big field. And uh, the task there becomes how to deconvolve from the uh, response of the system uh, under the simultaneous uh, action of the control in the presence of the noise, how to deconvolve and get information about the spectral properties of the noise itself. Now, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, quantum noise spectroscopy can mean uh, different things. It can uh, be differentiated on the basis of what control resources we have. And something which is particularly important to put in context what I'm going to say and often causes confusion, um, there is a difference between parameter estimation, so like estimating a specific parameter of a certain noise process, for instance, a T2 parameter or a T1 parameter, having assumed, because maybe we know the system reasonably well, that the noise uh, spectrum has a certain functional difference, that is a parametric estimation, as opposed to the task that I am particularly interested in here, which is full spectral estimation, which is non-parametric in the language of signal processing. And as to do, we really try, if you will, it can be akin to multi-parameter estimation, but you're basically trying to estimate a whole function uh, on a grid uh, via sampling, as you will see. There has been a lot of uh, uh, interest in this problem over the last, I would say, um, eight or nine years or so, uh, triggered by the fact that uh, we need better and better procedures for validating the behavior of the systems that we have. And uh, uh, also, as always, this progress and interest has been fueled by the fact that experimentalists have been able to put to work some of these um, uh, simple uh, protocols. So in particular, I I think many of you in this audience uh, are familiar with simple open loop dynamical decoupling pulsed protocol and there is uh, a, a broad range of techniques which use uh, interrogation of the system via control pulses as a diagnostic uh, way for figuring out the spectral properties. So, some experiment I would like to call attention to, and let me make a disclaimer, this list is incredibly um, you know, incomplete, not pretends to be uh, you know, exhaustive, but I am highlighting only certain experiments. In particular, to my knowledge, this uh, one experiment that comes from the group of some of our collaborators with Oliver Group at MIT was um, the first, I would say, where they have used some well-known multi-pulse sequence from the NMR world, the Carr, Purcell, Mabel, Gill sequence, which is this pattern of pi pulses separated by a certain delay time um, as a way to essentially uh, shape the filter function that we can think describes the response of the system uh, to the applied control in the presence of the noise. So these are plots of the filter functions which are as a function of frequency and what is changing here, for instance, this n is the number of pulses. Uh, this uh, you should think as being uh, like short 
ideally square pulses. And the intuition here is that this uh, applied control is effectively approximately implementing something that in engineering terms we can call a passband filter. So something that let a signal, the signal is the noise here, uh, a signal going through only uh, through a window of frequency. Now, of course, this is not true. That you see that the actual filter function is not d squared, but that is a topic. I will precisely come back in a second. Um, many other experiments followed. Another one I want to call attention to for reasons that will become clear is an, another experiment using uh, established NMR techniques, but towards the task of characterizing noise, which came from the group of Dieter Suter with Gonzalo Alvarez. And uh, uh, in this case, it was measuring, uh, well, I didn't say this explicitly, but here the system was a system, a uh, superconducting qubit system, a transmon. In this case, uh, it was a solid state, an MR host with a uh, uh, classical, uh, semi-classical limit for a spin bath decoherence being assumed. And this uh, results in a protocol which I will, refer in, I will be referring to as the alvarez suter protocol uh, later. Something uh, else that I would call attention to is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the only uh, attempt to do an experimental characterization of noise which does not obey Gaussian statistics. Um, however, in this experiment uh, by the Ozeri group, uh, uh, the estimation was not non-parametric, but was assuming rather some functional form for the noise. Anyway, um, all right, more experiment, as I said, in particular this recent or more recent one is really uh, interesting because uh, they demonstrated what would be the, 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 the whole philosophy here, which would be to try to characterize the noise uh, experienced by the qubit in the lab and then use that knowledge to improve uh, the control capabilities on that same system. And this was done in trapped ions. So I'm a theorist, so my interest in following this work has been like, well, uh, let's have a look, a critical look at this protocol. And uh, um, what we can see is that this scheme that I have been, that I have been alluding to, uh, they are applicable under pretty restrictive a priori assumptions. So here, the analysis is done already assuming that the noise is classical, that the noise has Gaussian statistics, or that the, it has already some properties built in. And uh, I would like to argue that generically, if we pretend that we don't have much information, and if I want to take the point of view of non-parametric estimation, uh, well, um, noise should be taken generically as non-Gaussian and non-classical, and maybe it, I don't want to say maybe, it will turn out that the Gaussian and the classical description will be perfectly accurate for the system under uh, consideration, but this is a conclusion that should be found as a result rather than an assumption, uh, so to speak. Um, also, um, over, over time here, this is a slightly more recent 2015 um, uh, reporting, a report of some theory and experiment work by the group of Chris Degen. Uh, what became clear is that one has to be careful in applying this protocol and uh, interpret the results uh, that one gets because it can be hard to disambiguate uh, the actual uh, signal of interest, which is the properties of the noise that we would like to have in, in a frequency band that we are interested at from some spurious frequency component that might come up. So there are indeed uh, uh, what these uh, nice uh, but still problematic work pointed out is that there are problems in that sense and these problems can be attributed to a well-known issue in classical signal processing which is spectral leakage. Uh, also, all of the experiments I have alluded to here and all of the other ones that I didn't put in the slides, they use only a single qubit as a probe 
But if we want, for instance, to probe crosstalks uh, between two qubits, or we want to know the, the cross-correlation spectra that two or more qubits uh, feel as a function of the spatial separation, for instance, clearly just one probe qubit is not enough. We need to go beyond. So this is the motivation for, uh, for the work that we have been doing uh, for the past uh, mm, several years uh, with the objective of uh, improving existing control theoretic schemes for noise spectral characterization uh, and trying to make them as uh, general and as also uh, applicable to real systems uh, as possible. So I, I'm sorry to say I don't have the perfect, uh, uh, complete, nice protocol to offer to you as yet. Uh, so what we are doing at the moment is to explore uh, different approaches, different possibilities, more or less in parallel, and trying to see uh, relative merits, weaknesses, and hopefully uh, learn from that. So what I will uh, be telling you about in the rest of the talk is two approaches. Um, and uh, one has to do with quantum noise spectroscopy based on a particular type of control modulation uh, that uh, tackles head on the problem of spectral leakage that I have mentioned quickly in the previous slide. Um, and uh, uh, this is work we are carrying out jointly with the University of Sydney for the experimental validation, uh, Mike's group. And uh, also we are collaborating with somewhere in the room back there, Dennis Lucarelli on the theory side. Uh, the other approach I would like to tell you about is instead more traditional, if you will, is related to dynamical decoupling, so multi-pulsed uh, uh, spectroscopy techniques. And uh, uh, there is theory work that we have done on how to go beyond the Gaussian approximation for both classical and quantum noise sources. By quantum here, I mean that the bath operators are taken to be non-commuting with one another, just to, to I, I will come back to it, but just to dissipate possible confusion um, in the defacing regime. I think for whatever uh, time I will spend on it, I will focus mostly or only on the classical noise setting because uh, that is the setting we are trying to experimentally validate, uh, in this case jointly with the group of Will Oliver uh, working with uh, injected flux noise in a particular type of superconducting qubit. So, um, without further ado, let me go a little bit in the first uh, uh, of the two approaches. Uh, I have already mentioned my main collaborators here, Mike, Dennis, and uh, the two uh, main uh, uh, experimentalists involved in uh, this uh, first work uh, that appeared last December reporting our um, uh, investigation, Virginia Fry and Sandeep Mavadia. And uh, of course, a uh, picture will come after, but my postdoc, Lee Norris, is also here in the audience. And uh, I would like to take the chance to indeed stress the fact that whatever I will not cover about this topic or subtopic here, uh, she has a much more complete account uh, for the underlying theory and also uh, the state of the art or where we are. As you will see, I will talk about amplitude noise in the control, but uh, uh, there is also work that is going on for defacing noise. So I will refer uh, you to her poster on Thursday and uh, Mike will also tell you a bit more about the experimental complications of all of this uh, in his talk on Friday. All right, so uh, the signal is in the noise. As we said, the task uh, that I am interested at in the non-parametric uh, setting that I like to work with, and now I am working with Gaussian noise, the simple spectral estimation task then becomes determining an unknown power spectrum or power spectral density, as it is often abbreviated, this should be done based on uh, looking uh, at how the applied control modifies the sensor response um, uh, in the frequency domain. 
So um, this is a cartoon picture uh, that uh, uh, illustrates the concept of a spectral leakage that I have already mentioned before. Uh, the idea here is that, uh, well, uh, if uh, we could uh, uh, design um, a filter um, in the frequency domain, which is ideally think about a delta function, uh, very narrow and um, something that can be placed wherever you like along the frequency axis within the region that you want to uh, interrogate, um, well, uh, then it would be possible uh, if the signal in the time domain is able to be expressed, we can see this as an overlap integral between a filter function that depends upon the control and the spectral properties. Uh, this is the noise power uh, spectrum of the noise, but if this filter would be sufficiently narrow so that we can essentially take the, the spectral density, the value outside the integral, then uh, it would be really easy to estimate the value of the PSD at the uh, frequency in question because all we have to do is to compute the area uh, of the filter function in the desired, in, in, the, in the passband that we have. Now, um, the problem with this, uh, it's a fundamental one, and uh, it relates to something that we also heard about this morning. It's kind of time energy uncertainty in a way, because clearly no signal, so no noise process is going to be acquired or monitored or whatever for infinite time. Every experiment has finite duration, so the signal is time limited. And uh, we know uh, very well that no signal of finite duration, so no time limited signal, is able to be simultaneously perfectly um, band limited in the frequency domain. So this means that uh, uh, every uh, realistic filter function that we might be able to shape uh, with control is never going to be perfectly square as we would like it to be, but there is going to be some extent, some leakage that is the spectral leakage that I was talking about, uh, there will be uh, side lobes that uh, uh, make it non-zero. There are non-zero frequency components outside the intended passband. And the presence of these uh, leaked components can uh, severely distort the reconstructed PSD that we can get. Now, luckily uh, for us, we don't have to reinvent the wheel <laughs> completely because this is not a, a problem that is only plugging quantum spectra. Uh, this is a well-known issue in classical signal processing. And in fact, um, the question of the extent to which a signal, which is time limited, uh, can also be limited in the frequency domain was posed uh, uh, back in the uh, 60s by Claude Shannon. And uh, this question uh, kind of triggered a lot of investigation by David Slepian uh, and co-workers. And in a series of influential papers uh, at IBM, uh, the theory of band-limited functions uh, was developed. And these are the functions that I'm going to be referring to. Uh, they have a funny long name. They are called uh, discrete prolate spheroidal sequences, DPSS but uh, affectionately called Slepian because the name is too long. So um, I am interested in the discrete time version of them. Um, and uh, you can think of them as being an orthonormal family of finite length. The length, this n is the length of the signal. Clearly, there is a delta t, which is the sampling time of them. And they are solution of a certain uh, toplitz eigenvalue equation. They have this, this they look like this in the time domain. Uh, K is an index that labels them. Uh, you see, this resembles a Gaussian, um, but it's not a Gaussian. Then we have a number of nodes that goes up uh, with the order. Most interesting, however, is how they look uh, like in the frequency domain, because the discrete time Fourier transform, uh, which brings in another name, which is terrible, so DPSWFs. Uh, so the discrete time uh, Fourier transform of these Slepian sequences, 
they are probably optimal among all the sequences which have the same length and are sharing the same bandwidth parameters. We said before that it's impossible to have simultaneous perfect time and frequency limitation, but this, which is the ratio of the signal uh, in the frequency domain in the band of interest with respect to the total signal in the principal domain uh, of the uh, signal itself, well, this is the spectral concentration ratio and what, what Slepian and co-worker proved is that this is best possible. And the quality of the spectral concentration is precisely determined uh, by the eigenvalue lambda k uh, that we have in this equation. So this is the plot and visually it should be clear that if uh, these vertical bars uh, label or indicate the intended passband, well, you see that uh, they're clear, they don't go exactly to zero, this would be impossible, but they are pretty concentrated as we would like them to be. All right, uh, indeed, let me say that they are pretty concentrated and uh, uh, the most spectrally concentrated one, they have an order which is upper bounded by this bandwidth product uh, 2 and W. Okay, so uh, this function, they have a very prominent role in classical spectral estimation thanks to the very nice mathematical properties that they have on which I will not dig into it. They, uh, are, they are the workhorse for what uh, people believe is the most uh, powerful non-parametric uh, spectral estimation method in the classical uh, world, which is used a lot in uh, uh, characterizing signal in, in, in medicine, in biology, uh, in um, geophysics, and that is called multi-taper spectral estimation. Uh, Multi-taper estimation was introduced in this beautiful paper by David Thompson in 1982 and the key idea here is to make use not just the one of these Slepian function but multiple of them, actually all the ones which are most spectrally concentrated with the idea of using them, is the laser still visible? Yes. Uh, with the idea of using them as windowing function for the signal of interest, uh, but uh, in a way, uh, thanks to the mathematical properties that they have, that allow a consistent estimator of the target PSD to be obtained. By which I mean consistent uh, uh, in the sense that as the size of the sample here n goes to infinity, uh, then uh, the, the variance of the estimator also goes to zero properly. So in the classical uh, context, multi-taper estimation is obtained by constructing multiple estimates by uh, multiplying uh, each, uh, each piece of data with a lower their uh, Slepian sequence and by constructing the final estimate through a weighted average uh, via certain coefficients that are determined iteratively. Let me highlight the intuition why this method works so nicely in the classical case. Uh, this is the type of, of filter that a multi-taper uh, estimation would proceed and it is almost nearly a square function with the wiggles in here that probably would disappear in the asymptotic limit. So this is uh, approaching the ideal passband that we would like to have for, for uh, estimation. So uh, what we have done is to port these ideas to the quantum domain and uh, as I said I will focus just uh, on uh, one type of noise, not the only one that we have looked at, which is multiplicative control noise, which is pretty much ubiquitously encountered in a lot of uh, settings. And this noise, control noise, is to very good accuracy taken to be classical. And uh, um, I'm also making the assumption here uh, of it being Gaussian. So without going too much into the detail, we have a driven single qubit Hamiltonian where omega of t is essentially a is the rabbi um, driving strength and the noise is, is encapsulated in this beta omega t and as you see is the amplitude of the driving is multiplying uh, the noise process itself. 
The evolution is described by a unitary propagator and uh, in a suitable limit where we can uh, take the, the strength uh, of the noise to be sufficiently weak or the evolution time to be sufficiently short. What I want to do is to truncate uh, the resulting Magnus expansion for uh, describing, for obtaining this error vector or this vector here. Um, what, uh, what is possible to see is that only the x component of this time dependent vector here is sensitive uh, or can sense the amplitude uh, uh, noise that we want to characterize. So this uh, second moment of the uh, error vector component is directly related to an observable quantity uh, which can be the survival probability of the system uh, in the up-z state. It's also related to the operational fidelity and that's the uh, expression that uh, we have. So uh, the control protocol here consists in taking a piecewise constant modulation with a slapian over n segments which have the same length with the result that if we take the discrete Fourier transform, we get exactly the slapian filter of order k as desired. Now, this filter is centered at omega equals zero, so clearly that's not enough to reconstruct a power spectral density. I need a mechanism for shifting the center of the passband around, but that's not hard to do because one can invoke uh, analog modulation techniques uh, from engineering, like single sideband modulation or here cosine modulation, by which we can shift the center to a desired uh, omega s, which is non zero. So uh, in the case of the quantum uh, multi so if we want to use a multi-taper strategy in the quantum setting, uh, we are still using multiple Slapian sequences and uh, we can construct different uh, uh, estimates for each of them. Uh, but one important difference with respect to the classical case is that they are not applied uh, to, the, uh, to the data before uh, like as a windowing uh, function, but they are essentially windowing the noise of interest before a measurement is done. I will skip the details on how to determine the coefficients for weighting uh, the, the estimates. Um, I would just like to highlight some results. These are numerical, but to show how actually leakage can be really distorting the estimated spectra. Um, in this case, the comparison uh, that uh, uh, we have been doing is one where we look at uh, estimation via one taper, one filter, the most concentrated, which is shifted around using cosine modulation against uh, a traditional scheme, which is uh, rotary uh, spin echoes. Think about a version uh, similar to dynamical decoupling, where instead of applying instantaneous pi pulses, uh, at some uh, specified times, there are phase shifts that are inserted, and uh, the control is piecewise constant. So what the filter, so in that case, the uh, the position of the filter is moved by changing the number of the shifts that are being uh, applied. So the representative filter, this is where we have n equals 7 of these shifts, um, uh, is one where, yes, there is a main lobe, but there are also side lobes which are absent here. And because in this spectrum of interest, it turns out that around the, uh, the region where the PSD is large, there are also these leaked components, these spurious components. They do matter when we do the integral and compute the overall uh, contribution. And what you can see is that, well, Unlike the green curve, which is the one due to the Slapian modulation, this kind of magenta one has really severe distortion in this position and also in here. Um, in the sake of time, I will skip this other beautiful, actually, application of multi-taper uh, for the case of identifying very fine spectral feature uh, in a spectrum. This is a very sharp line on a very flat kind of white noise. 
it can be used to do peak ident identification and then plugged in in parametric estimation schemes um, to obtain a high resolution estimate. Uh, we can talk over that later or at the poster. Let me just uh, uh, look at, let me just uh, conclude this part by showing uh, some of the experimental results. Uh, these are from the Nature Communication paper and uh, uh, in this case, the target uh, power spectral density that was engineered uh, in the amplitude uh, noise quadrature was one which is shaded here. I don't know if you can see it, uh, but uh, it, it's a flat top spectrum with a sharp frequency cutoff uh, about here. And uh, the uh, experimentally reconstructed spectrum, there are two variants here of which I will not go into detail on how the multi-taper implementation was done, but the upshot is that this estimate uh, match quality, they match qualitatively and quantitatively the applied noise spectrum within the resolution limit and subject to all the experimental inaccuracy, and they pinpoint correctly the spectral cutoff. So with that, I will move on, uh, on to the other uh, part and advances for the talk. And here you see uh, the main actors. So the theory uh, paper was done uh, quite some time ago. Uh, Lee, Gerardo, um, both here. And then uh, Felix uh, uh, joined later, but has been instrumental in bridging to the experimental system. So Will Oliver, Simon Gustafsson, and uh, Yang Q Sung deserves a lot of credit because the experimental validation of non-Gaussian spectroscopy is really challenging. Anyway, what am I talking about here briefly? Uh, in this case, uh, I am considering um, you know, uh, defacing noise so that the, in an interaction picture with respect to the Bath Hamiltonian, we can write the Hamiltonian in this form. And I am leaving, uh, this is a general slide where I leave the, the Bath uh, to be in principle quantum mechanical, but pretty soon I will make it a classical stochastic process. Um, defacing means that there is a preferred axis, and most importantly, let me highlight that in talking about non-Gaussian noise statistics, what I mean uh, and what is meant uh, is the fact that not just the two-point correlation function of which the spectrum is the Fourier transform, but in principle, an infinite family of multi-point correlation function here connected are relevant to characterize the noise statistics. And uh, um, these are ordered cumulants in the case that the bath operators are uh, quantum mechanical. And uh, um, something which is uh, uh, different in a classical and quantum case is that in the quantum case, these cumulant, which are traces over a bus state, they explicitly depend also upon the state on which uh, we are computing them. Now, stationarity will be and will remain an important assumption here, and that uh, enforces time translational symmetry. The cumulants have only to depend upon relative time separation. This is if and only if the initial state of the bath um, commutes is invariant under the action of the bath Hamiltonian. Okay, so uh, as I have mentioned, in the case where we have Gaussian statistics, we only have one spectrum to worry about. This is the PSD that I talked about. If we have a non-Gaussian process, if, even if we make the simplifying assumption that is zero mean, the noise spectral properties in the frequency domain, they involve uh, a whole family of, uh, of spectra which are called high order spectra or polyspectra in a classical signal processing. And clearly, there is no hope to characterize all of them, but usually in practice, the low order uh, terms are giving us a good uh, representation. So the, uh, the two most important ones are the bispectrum, which is a function of two frequency variable, trispectrum, a function of three, and so on and so forth. Now, I will work here uh, by assuming, 
uh, for the time being, this is not going to be true in the experiment, that we have access to ideal, instantaneous, nice pi pulses. And so the effect of the control on the dephasing qubit is encapsulated entirely uh, by a plus minus switching function, which is this y of t. And uh, um, the qubit coherence uh, as a function of time, clearly population remains constant, but all the action is in the coherence, the off-diagonal element, uh, that will in general uh, undergo both a decay, uh, this chi and this phi are both real function, so you should think of them as uh, this chi characterizing the decay uh, and this phi being a phase evolution which is due to the noise on the off-diagonal density matrix. And the nice uh, property is that there is a nice separation between um, the fact that uh, even an odd order cumulants, they contribute respectively only to the decay, the even ones, uh, and only to the phase evolution, the odd ones. Um, so our goal here, the control task, is to reconstruct not only the, the, the spectrum, but the next, the leading order non-Gaussian uh, high order spectrum, which could be the bispectrum or the tri-spectrum, depending on the symmetry properties of the noise. So uh, in frequency space, what enables us to carry out this task is a property that actually hinges upon some general work that Gerardo and I did when he was still in Dartmouth um, on understanding the structure of general uh, filter function in frequency domain. Basically here, the upshot is that uh, for the type of dephasing noise that we are considering and this instantaneous control, all the filter function that we need, they can be seen as products uh, of one single fundamental filter function, uh, which is what enables us to extend the idea of the alvarez suter protocol, which I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my talk, to the non-Gaussian setting. So in essence, the alvarez suter idea is um, to enforce the appearance of a frequency comb via the repetition of a fixed uh, dynamical decoupling sequence. And the way to understand that is that uh, if we consider filter functions, um, in the Gaussian case, we only have one filter function to worry about, and that is the regime in which Alvarez and Suter uh, have been working. Uh, well, if we repeat a dynamical decoupling protocol periodically in time, what the, the filter function of the whole composite sequence is, it looks like a diffraction, diffraction grating because what you have is like the filter function of the uh, original one times this kind of highly oscillatory factor, which in the limit where this number of repetition m is sufficiently large, gives us a comb. Now, uh, this was their beautiful intuition and what made their experiment work for Gaussian noise. Uh, we have non-Gaussian noise, but the key uh, theoretical result here is that as long as we have stationarity, the fact that we have this nice structure of arbitrary uh, filter function being product of, uh, of uh, um, uh, 10, five plus question. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, thank you. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, enables, uh, the fact that we have this nice uh, um, structure of filter function being product of simple building blocks makes it possible to prove that sequence repetition still creates a comb in all the direction that we need to sample the high order spectrum that we need. For instance, this is a cartoon. If we are interested, as the experiment will, in sampling, reconstructing the, the bispectrum, a two-dimensional grid is what we need. And uh, the, uh, the, the location, the point at which this delta function appears is determined by the control sequences that we applied. Indeed, uh, here is the mathematical problem. Uh, this is the phase angle that we have for different sequences, uh, each of them being repeated m time. Um, and these will be the observable quantities to be measured. 
Um, this is the bispectrum values at the grid points that the sequence repetition creates. And in between, we have a matrix whose coefficients uh, we know they are the control variable because this is a complicated expression, but it boils down to have products of filters that are for us to design in such a way, in such a way that what we uh, for the expert here, uh, to my understanding, it can be told as, as a multi Joseph junction version of a, of a C shunt. Uh, flux qubit, so it's kind of in between a flux and a transform with nice features. And uh, um, uh, the idea here is to park this qubit uh, in a sweet spot of the parameter space. Of course, there is a lot of characterization work that had to be done uh, in terms of characterizing coherence properties, uh, control capabilities, quality of pi pulses, and so on and so forth. And uh, if the qubit would be parked, as this data um, uh, show, this is a quadratic fit and is consistent with, with the fact that the qubit is reasonably well at a sweet spot in terms of the known spectrum of the Gaussian noise that we inject, and notice that it has a qubit dependence upon the spectrum. So I will cut a long story short. The phase is obtained by looking at expectation values of x and y. In the experiment, uh, all we could do is to repeat the control sequences uh, a maximum of 11 times, the controls actually 10 times. The control sequences themselves, they consist of very short ultra reconstruction has been done in a, in a quantum setting. So what you see here uh, are the, as a function of the different uh, sequences that we have, uh, this would be take it to be as the one that we would like to have. Um, well, uh, you see that clearly the maximum value is off, is off by quite a bit. You also see that there are some extra structure here, sort of a leakage out. Um, so that's what I said, uh, there is qualitative agreement, not yet uh, quantitative agreement to the level that I would like to see. Uh, and probably uh, pulse imperfections here uh, play a major role, not surprisingly. But there might also be other types of uh, measurement, classical signal processing um, estimation for high order spectra with Slepian that I'd like to look into that. And with that, thank you. Uh, let me advertise one more time uh, Lee's poster, Mike's poster, and one more poster from a member of my group which is not related to spectral estimation directly, but rather quantum metrology and the extent to which non-Markovian temporally and spatially... <laughs>